भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिंगुष्टवाग सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति नूषा विश्ववेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टनेमि स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 ओम ओ गॉड्स मे वी हियर ऑस्पिशियस वर्ड्स विथ इयर्स वाइल एंगेज इन सैक्रिफाइसिस मे वी सी ऑस्पिशियस थिंग्स विथ द आईज वाइल प्रेजिंग द गॉड्स विथ स्टडी लिम्स may we enjoy a life that is beneficial to the gods may indra of ancient fame be auspicious to us may the all knowing pusha god of the earth be propitious to us may garuda the destroyer of evil be well disposed towards us may brihaspati ensure our welfare om peace 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 now namaste and good evening although i don't think it's evening everywhere there are people from all across the world different time zones so it's been a quite a gap nearly uh, more than two and a half months so a um, little catch up we um are studying the mundaka upanishad in the mundaka upanishad what has happened so far is that uh, the student shaunaka he comes to the teacher angiras and asks the question sir what is that by knowing which everything is known kasminnu bhagavo vigyate sarvam idam vigyatam bhavati iti sir what is that knowing which everything is known and um, instead of answering directly the teacher first says that knowing knowledge is actually of two kinds one is the knowledge by which uh, the ultimate reality is known and the other is the knowledge of everything else there is para and apara the transcendent knowledge and the relative knowledge and then he goes on to define what this relative knowledge is the apara vidya and he basically talks about everything so everything that we study is the relative knowledge whatever we know in this world is relative knowledge including the vedas including the, the religious scriptures then what is the um, uh, supreme knowledge what is para vidya the transcendent knowledge he says para yaya tad aksharam adhigamyate that by which the imperishable is realized is the supreme knowledge is the transcendent knowledge and uh, then he goes on to talk about the imperishable what is this imperishable and he says that there is that from which the entire world has come he talks about the ultimate reality beyond all attributes nirguna brahman and the ultimate reality with attributes god saguna brahman and uh, the knowledge of that he says it's it's that by knowing which one knows everything and of course by that we we should understand one knows everything in the sense that that brahman is the reality of everything so when one knows everything means you know that everything is brahman whatever you come across in life it is brahman and you are brahman so this is the ultimate knowledge what's the point of all of this the point is the same project which is there all throughout vedanta that is overcoming suffering and attainment of fulfillment it is because we do not know ourselves and this world as brahman that we are continuously unfulfilled we are we feel insecure uh, we feel afraid we feel um, Uh, lack of completion and therefore we reach out into this world um, to fulfill our desires to avoid sorrow and pain um, and none of that really works unless we know ourselves as the limitless as the infinite so for example the fear of death the biggest fear the greatest fear it will not go away until you realize you are immortal um, so the the lack of fulfillment it will not go away until you realize you are infinite that all, all of it whatever there's nothing in this universe which is not yours which is not you really then fulfillment comes 
So in this way. Now, that was the first uh, section which we did. And then the Upanishad takes a pause to talk about um, Aparavidya. So it's made this clean distinction between the transcendent knowledge and the lower knowledge, the higher knowledge and the lower knowledge. The knowledge of the of Brahman, realization that you are Brahman, is the higher knowledge. But there's this lower knowledge. And then the Upanishad is going to talk about that, has started talking about it. Why does it talk about uh, the lower knowledge? Because the Upanishad is actually embedded in the Vedas. It's part of the Vedic tradition. And if you look at the Vedas, the Vedas have a clear structure. Uh, there is what is called the Karma Kanda, the ritualistic portion, and the Jnana Kanda, the knowledge portion. What we are studying, the Upanishads, they are the knowledge portion. And Upanishads refer to that, uh, that knowledge portion is actually what is called the higher no uh, knowledge, the Paravidya. Again, technically, if you remember, the higher knowledge is not even the Upanishads. It's that enlightenment which makes you realize that you are Brahman. That is specifically the higher knowledge. Even the Upanishads are higher knowledge only in a secondary sense because they will help you to get that enlightenment. Um, but anyway, there is this bulk of the Vedas. The Most of the text is ritualistic. It's full of various kinds of rituals. And uh, that is what is meant by the lower knowledge or the relative knowledge, Aparavidya. Remember, relative knowledge is all kinds of knowledge, including our science, our literature, um, art, all of that, history, everything that we study, all secular knowledge and all religious knowledge, all of that is the lower knowledge. Um, but in the Upanishad, because it's the Vedic context, so when it talks about the lower knowledge, it talks about the just what is there in the Vedas, that is the ritualistic portion of the Vedas. And then we saw it talks about the various elaborate rituals which are mentioned in the ritualistic portion, the Karma Kanda. The Karma Kanda itself has actually two parts. One is known as Karma, which literally means ritual, and the other one is known as Upasana, which means meditation or worship. Both of them are, are action. The rituals are physical actions. So they light a sacrificial fire, design the altar, light the fire. There are priests who will chant and physically offer oblations. So there are very specific rituals for that. And the upasana, the meditation or the worship portion, is the mental worship. So there are certain things to be visualized. But they are, that's also action. One is mental action. The other one is physical and verbal action. Um, and that's why the whole thing can be called karma kanda, ritualistic portion. Now, what was the goal of the karma kanda? Why would they perform these? The same goal, overcoming suffering and attainment of happiness. That's the basic goal of all human beings. The way the karma kanda tries to do this is to use these rituals in order to fulfill desires. So lead a pious life, ethical and pious life, and then engage in these religious acts. And uh, because of these religious acts, they produce a certain merit. Uh, what we would today karma, they had a technical name for that. The result of the, of the Vedic religious acts are called apurva. So like accumulated merit. And what does that do? And that's invisible. We don't know. We don't see it. You can actually see the rituals being performed. They are quite elaborate and uh, uh, yeah. and what the result that they generate is a matter of faith. That's why it's religion, it's not science. It's a matter of faith. The ancient Vedic people believed it generated a lot of good karma, which they called Apurva. And that good karma would give results in our lives. What, what were the results? Basically, whatever we wanted. So results could be this worldly or otherworldly. This worldly results would be anything. People wanted uh, wealth, people wanted to, kings wanted to conquer other kingdoms. So the, we often hear of the famous Ashwamedha Yagya, one of the most elaborate rituals uh, in the Vedas. The goal was very worldly. You know, the king can expand his empire or kingdom. Um, there were people who wanted rainfall, cattle. So cattle was the form of wealth you know, in, uh, in ancient and in Vedic times. So you would want more cattle. Your herds would expand. 
not only in Vedic times and in the Wild West also, cattle was uh, was <laughs> was was wealth here in the in America itself. So you would want more of cattle or rainfall, or uh, you want want to prevent diseases. Uh, you wouldn't want children and grandchildren. So whatever people wanted, those you you could get. And not only that, um, people believed in multiple heavens, not just one heaven, but multiple heavens. And uh, the Vedic people believed in it. The Buddhists believed in it. The Jainas, all the ancient Indian religious people in India, they believed in multiple heavens. And you could get these heavens by the force of the merit accumulated in the Vedic rituals. Could perform a number of these Vedic rituals and the result would be after death, your accumulated apurva, the merit, would ensure that you, not the physical body, the sentient being, the, the jivatma, would go to another world, a heavenly world, and stay there. And it would be a very, very pleasant experience. And there are descriptions of heaven in, in magnificent terms. You do not age there. There is no physical disease, nor is hunger. Um, hunger doesn't trouble you. Disease doesn't trouble you. Uh, it's always, you know, air conditioned. There is no <laughs> heat and cold. Um, there are no enemies, except, of course, sometimes demons come, come and attack. But otherwise, the heavens are very secure. Like They are like gated communities. So you're, you're very happy and secure. Um, now, and there's, there are descriptions. We, we read it last time. After death, the person who has performed these Vedic uh, rituals, they are greeted by heavenly beings who say, eh, he, eh, he, come, come this way. And they chant in your glory and they will they'll say, this is the world that you have won by your pious, Vedic, pious lifestyle. You know, the... Um, the Vedic rituals that you have performed, your merit has won you this world. And you stay there for a very, very long time. In the Gita, Sri Krishna says that um, you stay for a very long time enjoying heavenly felicities. Um, and then, but the problem is, this is all won by karma. And karma is limited. No matter how much good karma one does and how much bad karma one does, the result is always limited. The enjoyment generated by good karma is limited. It will come to an end. By limited, I mean it will come to an end. And the suffering generated by bad karma is limited. That will also come to an end. And when it does come to an end, we are back to the same cycle. We are again reborn in this world, hopefully as human beings, usually as human beings, but the Upanishad will say it might not be. There might be inferior births also. Why? Because if all your credit is exhausted, uh, all the good karma is exhausted, then bad karma might take hold of us and then whirl us into uh, animal births or whatever. And thus it will go on. So the net, the point of all of this is, yes, the ritualistic religion does work. However, it is strictly limited. It will. It is no deep solution to our problem of samsara. It just extends samsara. It gives you a pleasant samsara. It gives you a nice life here and a nice life hereafter. But all of it comes to an end. And again, we are back to the same grind. It is not liberation. It's not moksha. It's not freedom. It is just this life. So Hindus, even today, although the old Vedic religion is gone, um, but it still lives on in many forms in modern Hinduism. The old fire sacrifices have been replaced by our elaborate pujas. But the rituals still live on. So if you see traditional Hindus, they, there are many who perform rituals when they want something. When they think the things are going badly for them, they have had a series of problems in their life, maybe disease or accident or something. They'll perform rituals to ward off uh, bad karma um, or whatever. Or if they want something in this life, um, it, whatever it is. Someone to get married, someone to have children, someone to get a job or whatever it is. There will be pujas for that. It's the same philosophy coming from the karma kanda. Do this ritual, it will generate good karma and you will get what you want. None of it is very spiritual at all. It's still pretty worldly. Even the otherworldly stuff. Yes, it's good in the sense that one has to be a little, um, has to lead a disciplined life otherwise. If a person is very immoral and indisciplined, they, they cannot, these, these will not work. The rituals demand that we lead a, a pure life. That sense, it's a little disciplined. Um, 
what else did I want to say? Yes, one more point before I get to the mantras themselves. Um, one might ask, so what is the relevance of this today? I can understand the relevance of spirituality, of the meditation and knowledge and devotion. But these rituals, what is the relationship today to, to our lives? And there is a lot. It's, it's very relevant. Though we may not perform uh, elaborate fire sacrifices, it's very difficult in modern American homes because they all have fire alarms. So even when a little ritual is to be performed, uh, I, I have seen that all the time. People ask, have you switched off the fire alarm? Or, um, but conventional religion continues. This, this understanding of religion as a support in our worldly life. You have a family, a job, you have your own financial and physical health to think of. People are weak, people are insecure, and they need the help of religion, the help of God. This you see in every religion. Why just modern Hinduism? In every religion, there are more takers for this kind of religion today, and they always were, and they always will be for this kind of religion. You might call it mass religion. That religion, our prayers, our rituals, they're all meant to be an aid to our present life. Not for enlightenment, nirvana, or moksha, not for that. Just for this life. Let things go well here. Um, one might say, what's wrong with that? Nothing wrong with it. That is conventional religion. That's why most people go to temples, uh, churches. Uh, if you go to a church service, for example, you see a lot of the prayers are for, you know, such and such member of our congregation was ill. Let us pray for, uh, you know, that person may recover. Uh, things like that. Let us pray for this person or that person, for this cause or that cause. All of it is this worldly. And that's conventional religion. But what is going to be pointed out is um, spirituality is higher than this. I always say the difference between spirituality and conventional, the higher religion and the conventional religion, between spirituality and mass religion, the difference is this. Is God for my life or is my life for God? Is God the goal or is this world the goal? If this life, this, this world is the goal, then it's conventional religion. Money is good for me. Um, a nice environment is good for me. Law and order is good for me. Um, you know, nice people I want around me. And I also want God in my life because it all adds to a good life in this world. And hopefully I will go to heaven after death. So this is conventional religion. And what I'm stressing is, this is very much a reality. If you look at religion around the world, the most popular kind, the maximum number of people go to, for this kind of religion, whether it's a temple, a church, a mosque, a synagogue, whatever it is. And this is part of conventional religion and it's not to be frowned upon. This is every religion does this and it will continue. There is, uh, and there's nothing wrong in it. What's good from a spiritual perspective, what's good about this? What's good is this, at least it generates faith in God. So if you go to a temple or a church and ask for and pray for something in this world, like curing an illness or you know getting a job or whatever it is, uh, and it works. It uh, it increases faith in God that there is some something, there's some power which I can rely upon. Mental health. It's now a well known fact that uh, psychiatrists say that is a well known fact that those who have a deep and genuine connection with religion, um, they are generally better off mental health wise. And even if they have mental health problems, they are more resilient. They can recover or handle it better than people who have no religious faith. All. So physical health, mental health, um, community, family life, all of it is actually improved by conventional religion. Why am I saying all this? Because this conventional religion is now going to be criticized sharply. That's why. So it, criticism is only from the perspective of trying to push us to an understanding of the higher religion. See, the student asked, what is that by knowing which everything is known? He's asking this question about the highest question, the ultimate reality of this universe. So uh, the teacher is showing him this journey from conventional religion to spirituality. So there will be a criticism of conventional religion. And what was conventional religion in those days? The Vedic Karmakanda, the ritualistic portion of the Vedas. Now that's going to be, that was praised in the last few mantras which we did before summer. Now that will be sharply criticized. So that's the background. 
we had done up to um, mantra number 1.2.6. 1.2.6. Now we'll go to 1.2.7, which is where the criticism begins. 1.2.7. Plava yete adrira yagya rupa ashtadashoktam avaram ye shukarma etat shreyo ye abhinandanti mura jaram rityum te punare vapiyanti. Translation. Since these 18 constituents of a sacrifice on whom the inferior karma has been said to rest are perishable because of their fragility. Therefore, those ignorant people who get elated with the idea, this is the cause of bliss, undergo old age and death over again. Let me go to the original commentary by Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya introduces this criticism by saying that, all right, this is part of religion. However, from a higher perspective, note that all of this avidya kama karma, all rituals are avidya kama karma karya, the effect, the product of um, actions prompted by desires born of ignorance. Ignorance, avidya. Kama, desire. Karma, action. So this is a phrase which Shankaracharya is very fond of. Avidya kama karma which basically describes all our worldliness. So all worldly activities, whatever we, we pursue in this world, good things, which have led to the you know development of civilization and everything. But whatever we do in this world, uh, this is karma. And this behind this karma is desire, karma. I want, I want. I'm unfulfilled. Where does this desire come from? It comes from, Avidya, ignorance. Ignorance of what? Uh, that I am Brahman, my ever-fulfilled nature. I am ever-fulfilled. I just don't know it. I just don't see it. And therefore, desire comes. Uh, it is inevitable. Not knowing my nature as Brahman, absolutely not aware of it, what is presented to me? This mind, this body, this personality. And clearly this personality is so limited. It is subject to old age and disease and death. And those are the big things. But also the daily dissatisfaction. I, I need food and drink and uh, air and uh, protection, you know, a house and um, human society. So many things are necessary for me to continue as a healthy individual. And that too for a very short period of time, for a few years. And uh, it is attended to with... A lot of trouble you have to put, you know, to just to lead a wholesome life in this world. And that seems to be continuously falling apart. And as you grow older, it becomes more and more difficult. The struggle becomes more and more difficult. Um, right. Now, therefore, when we have this personality, this body-mind, it is it is obvious that we will be insecure. It's obvious that we'll be scared. It's obvious that we'll be grasping and desiring this and that. And uh, that's our life. So, avidya kama karma. And that's not just our worldly work. Even these, Shankaracharya says, even these religious rituals which we perform, they're also prompted by fear. They're also prompted by desire. Um, so, there's a word used, plava. Adrira Yagya Rupa, he says, they're like rafts, um, little boats, fragile little boats on a stormy ocean. If the, the idea is this, those religious persons, those pious persons who want to solve their problems in this life by these Vedic rituals, it is a foolish endeavor because these rituals are like frail, fragile rafts frail rafts on a tumultuous ocean. You're going to drown. It's not going to save you. And uh, he explains here, um, he describes the uh, rituals as ashtadasha, uh, that 18 factors are involved. What are the 18 factors? Shankaracharya explains, shodasha ritvijaha patni yajamanascha iti ashtadasha. So in the big Vedic rituals, there used to be 16 priests together. 
uh, 16 priests 16 ritualists they would chant you would hire them if you wanted a ritual to be performed for to fulfill your desire the 16 priests would come they had specific duties and they would perform the ritual plus you would be there the yajamana the the man of the house patnishcha and his wife so the husband and the wife and by the way it was only married people husband and wife who were uh, authorized who had the right to perform these rites the the authority to perform these vedic rites so a monk couldn't perform them for example uh, an unmarried um, man or woman couldn't perform them you would have to be a couple that's why there's a very interesting story when rama had so unfairly banished sita to the forest and then he wanted to perform this huge ritual to you know expand his kingdom he couldn't because without sita he's not uh, he's not eligible to perform a ritual ritual and then there's the story of the golden sita that he made a sita uh, a statue out of gold and that sat next to him uh, when he performed the ritual so it was imperative that you had to be a couple and therefore vedic the karma kanda the vedic ritualistic religion was actually primarily for married people monks had no role that's why the upanishads were Uh, vedanta was uh, uh, was for everybody including monks but the rituals were very specific for uh, non monastics um then he says etat etat shreyo ye abhinandanti mura those who celebrate this that we are um, uh, pious people we are devout people and we are on the right path and we will be happy in this life she is muraha they are foolish again remember they are foolish with with respect to vedanta with respect to the higher spiritual life the, that in the foolish in the sense that it will not work but they are not foolish compared to say people who you know the addict on the street or the criminal um, in, in the jail no the addict or the criminal or the just the gross materialist uh, ha- is much worse because that person has already invited trouble and suffering to himself and causes suffering to everybody else around him and is a menace to society whereas these people are the very backbone of society these people these ritualists these devout people in every religion they are basically what constitutes civilization so all of society is made of such people they're decent people they are they are the people who's you know they constitute the the good families um, they are the very foundation of a good functioning society however the criticism is jara mrityum te punareva api anti they fall into um the uh, old age and death again what does again mean so having enjoyed heaven for some time shankaracharya says kinchit kalam for a short period of time for a period of time swarge sthitva having enjoyed heaven dwelling the heaven dwellers but all heavens are temporary as are hells as are these lives only brahman is eternal the only the spiritual reality god brahman the ultimate reality is eternal everything else changes so they will come back to this world and uh, they'll be troubled again by birth and sickness and toil and um, you know strife in this world and ultimately disease old age and death and how many times punaha again and again and again then the next uh, verse so this criticism will continue for 3 4 verses verse number 8 अविद्यायामंतरे वर्तमाना स्वयं धीरा पंडित मन्यमा जंघन्यमा पर्यती मूढ़ा अंधे नीयमा translation remaining within the fold of ignorance and thinking we are ourselves wise and learned the fools while being buffeted very much ramble about like the blind led by the blind alone so very graphic description what happens to such people again remember he is not condemning 
conventional religion. Not is he condemning such people. He's just showing that there is a higher path. You have asked for that ultimate reality. Compared to that, this is an inferior path. But these are all good and pious people. And you say, but they are suffering. Yes, but their suffering is actually much less than the suffering of most people in this world. Those who are not pious, those who are not uh, moral, ethical, their suffering is even more. They fall into trouble in this life, they cause trouble to others, and they fall into hell after this life. So they talk, these, this, these are people who actually go to heaven after death. Um, so he says, Avidhyaya mantare vartamana. In the midst of ignorance. Av, um, Shankaracharya uses the word aviveka praya. Uh, those who are immersed, immersed in ignorance. So the ignorance of not knowing their real nature, that's of course the ultimate ignorance. Um, and then the ignorance of being, thinking, I am this body. Then the ignorance, the multiple ignorances, the ignorance of the, all the consequences of that original ignorance. The ignorance of thinking that, um, uh, you know, uh, wealth will fulfill me, people and relatives will fulfill me, um, gadgets will fulfill me, job and, uh, you know, awards and recognition and friends will fulfill me. They do. They do. I was reading Christopher Isherwood. He says, this criticism of worldly pleasures is... Uh, he says, it, it's silly. Don't pretend that you don't like it. You do like it. But what is meant when, you crit when these are criticized is that to think that these will fulfill us somehow, that they will give us an lasting fulfillment and that we'll be done with it. That's insanity. He says, that is insanity. Spiritual, he says, Christopher Shabbat, he says, spiritual life is basically a call to sanity, that none of this is working. You do enjoy these pleasures and don't pretend that you don't. But uh, notice that they are not fulfilling you. They're, none of it is lasting. None of it is, um, and time is running out. You know, uh, old age and death are coming. The Upanishad would say they're coming again. Once again, they're coming. They have come many times in your past. So immersed in ignorance, and Shankaracharya uses an interesting term for ignorance: aviveka, lack of discernment. The truth is right here. But uh, we are seeing it covered up, mixed up with the appearance. So it's not that we are seeing the world and there's something else called Brahman which we have to realize. It's right here. We are actually experiencing Brahman all the time. But we are uh, unable to discern it from the network of Maya, from the names and forms and the activities which cover like Brahman like a net. It's, it's right here. It always was here. And when we become enlightened, we will realize all the time it was here. <laughs> but I just didn't see it at all. So, Aviveka Praya, immersed in lack of discernment. But, what is a big problem? See, if the, all this was recognized, it wouldn't be a problem. But it's not recognized. The vast majority of people don't recognize it. It has to be taught to us. It has to be told. You have to go to you know Upanishad class and then it has to be pointed out. What is the source of our problem? We are suffering, but we don't see the source of our problem. We just repeat the same solutions. I'm unhappy. So what do I need? I need pleasure. I need entertainment. I need money. I need people. I need uh, more time and a healthy time. All of these. And I don't even question it. So here he says, Swayam dhira panditam manyavana. He says, Shankaracharya explains, that the problem is we, such people, they think we know. We are wise people. We understand what life is all about. Now, the problem with that kind of wisdom is then they are unteachable. Until a person asks a question, the person cannot be taught, which is the main reason why Vedanta has never been really missionary. One must have a serious crisis, a question, like Arjuna had. Notice, in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna... He comes charging into the battlefield already. He thinks he's, he is he knows it all and he's going to fight this battle and get what is his and punish the villains. But then he has a crisis and he complains. He tells Krishna about his doubts, his worries. 
Even then Krishna does not reply. It's only when Arjuna asks a serious question. I'm in trouble. I just don't get what I'm going to do now. What's the point of this? And therefore, what is the point of anything at all? And then what should I do? And you are the teacher. You are fit to teach me. I am your student. Please help me out of this. And then Krishna opens his mouth. In the, that's well into the second chapter. The first chapter, Arjuna speaks. Krishna doesn't say anything. So the problem is, as long as we think we understand, we won't ask a question. Sri Ramakrishna, we are reading in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. He says, um, people, he gives the example of the camel, which eats thorny bushes. And the thorny bushes, they cut its lip and it bleeds. And it's, it hurts. But the camel just knows how to eat that. And that's what it does. It goes back there again and it gets cut and bleeds and it goes back again and eats that. Eats thorny bushes. Another example Sri Ramakrishna gives is uh, there are the prickly leaves around a pineapple, the fruit. He says they will not, people don't, there are people who eat the leaves, the prickly leaves around the pineapple and they miss the fruit itself. And it's a good example because the prickly leaves are very poor fare, especially compared to the pineapple. That's one. Second, the pineapple is right there. It's not something different far away. It's right there. It's a lack of discernment. Something which is there, which will actually fulfill, fulfill you, will give you security, take you beyond fear, fear, will give you lasting fulfillment. That's there, but we somehow don't see it. And here the Upanishad says we don't see it because such people, dhira, dhimanta, dhimanta means possessed of acute intelligence. We are intelligent. Not only intelligent, pandita, we are pandits. So this is an old Sanskrit word, now it's part of English. So you have Wall Street pandits, you have political pandits. Um, but originally it meant a traditional scholar. A pandit is a person who is a scholar. There's another deeper meaning of pandit, by the way, it's not relevant here. The deeper meaning of pandit is the one who has panda. The Sanskrit word panda, Shankaracharya explains as atma vishaya pragya. The wisdom regarding the self that I am Brahman. This, this is this, this is the meaning of the word panda, and the one who has that is a pandit. So literally, the word pandit, in the original spiritual sense, means an enlightened person who realizes that I am Brahman. Anyway, not relevant here. Here he says, pandita, vidita vedita vyascheti manyamana. They think we know what has to be known. I understand life or I understand the world. I am a PhD in science or I understand psychology or I, you know, I'm, I'm rich. I have made my, I've, you know, I've made millions. And so I know a thing or two about life. Manyamana means um, pride, a kind of uh, self-serving pride, which is, so why should I learn from you? Why should I learn from it? What is there for me to learn? I know it. Shankaracharya comments there, Atmanam Sambhavayanta Glorifying themselves. Even if they don't say it, they think it. People think it that I know. Therefore, I don't have to learn all this from you or from any text. Well, one might say, maybe they do know. How do you know that they don't know? Well, they don't know because look at the result. He says, Janghanyamana. They are, they suffer. They suffer so terribly. Uh, he says, Shankaracharya explains here, how do they suffer? Jara roga di aneka anatha pratehi. Prata means, the Sanskrit word prata means collection, group. A collection of a, a whole bunch of evils. There is illness, physical and mental. There is uh, um, poverty, actual or imagined. <laughs> there is a poverty mentality that I don't have enough. How much? How much is enough? The definitions of enough differ from, mm, you know, from society to society in in one's lifetime also from in different times in one's life. So nothing is enough. Um, Jara, old age, roga, disease, aneka, many kinds of unfortunate, ill, uh, Ill fortune. And it will come to everybody. It will come to everybody. 
Brisham Pidyamana, being troubled terribly. One, many people will say, especially in, um, you know, fortunate, advanced societies, well-off societies like this, I'm not really under terrible suffering. This doesn't seem to describe my state of... And then uh, Upanishad will say, just you wait. Just you wait. <laughs> It'll come to everybody. You are eternal beings. You will not. You are not born with the birth of this body. You will not die with the death of this body. So that's good. Not, not really. Because <laughs> there are lots and lots of things which have happened to you in the past and lots that's going to happen in this life and in lives to come. So... Um, pariyanti what happens vibramanti they go round and round they wander around so the example they give is like the blind led by the blind so the way in the world as blind people he says darshana vajjita uh, vajjita tvad andheneva achakshukshkena he says as they wander around they due to lack of Lack of seeing. They don't see what's going on in life. And it's made worse because they are led. Niyamana, pradarshana marga. Just as if I don't see and you are wise, please teach me. I want to know what is right and wrong. What should I do with my life? What is the goal in this life? And there are people ready to teach us. First and foremost, culprits our own parents. And then the, the education system. And then society itself, it sort of educates us into being worldly in this world. Um, and uh, there is no teaching about spirituality at all, especially in, 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 the day to, in these days, today. So we think this world, it's good. This is what there is in this life. I uh, need to be popular and rich and successful. Um, and win the rat race. Winner of the rat race is also a rat. But, uh, and if you ask then, I don't know then. Right now, let me do that first. The result will be, either you will succeed in doing what you wanted to do. The result of that, getting what you wanted to get and doing what you wanted to do, the result will be dissatisfaction. That I, I got it all, but I didn't get the kind of satisfaction I thought I would get. Money and relationships and, you know, travel and entertainment, all of that, loads of it, has still not fulfilled me. The problem is our ignorance. It's not really the problem of money. It's not the fault of other people. It's not the fault of the job. It's not even the fault of the body. They are all doing exactly what they, they can do. But we expected too much of them. We expected, like, limitless undying fulfillment from them. It's impossible. Nothing in the limited in the world can give you limitless uh, fulfillment. So, andheneva niyamana yathandha, just as the blind led by the blind. He says, loke, as in the world, the example is andha akshi rahita, those who are uh, deprived of vision. Gat just as they fall into a pit or they fall into a, a you know thorny bush uh, and uh, they get hurt exactly in the same way though we do not see what life we don't we don't understand what life is about and we get hurt again and again and worse we think we know or we are led by people who think they know uh, and uh, we we go from Problem to problem. A psychologist said, you know, with all our therapy and counseling, what we can do at best is tune you up so that you can, with what we call normal is, you can sort of be normally unhappy, just like everybody else. That's the best you can expect. And that also is only temporary. I know this person, she suffered a terrible bereavement, but she's a trained counselor psychologist and she says I have counseled people who have suffered similar bereavements but when it happened to me let me tell you none of it works none of it works is there anything that will work yes yes um, spirituality works 
and it has been demonstrated again and again. Not that it will remove the suffering caused by the bereavement or the illness or whatever it is, but um, you will find something deep which uh, and unshakable, centered in which Gita says even the heaviest of sh sorrows cannot shake you. Um, Krishna says, Yasmin sthito dukkhena guruna apina vichalyate, centered in which even the heaviest of sorrows cannot blow you away, cannot, cannot shake you, cannot move you. That means the heavy sorrows will keep coming. Whatever, light or heavy, whatever is there because of our past karma, they will keep coming. But you have found a secure foothold. In, in, that is in the realization that you are the Atman. Or if you are a devotee in, in your beloved Lord and nothing else matters. I mean, it will not shake you. In the New Testament, Jesus also says that those who build their house upon sand, you know, the winds will blow and then great will be the fall of that house. But those who build their house upon solid rock, in the winds will blow, but the house will not be sh shaken. Solid rock is this, spirituality. Self-knowledge, it's one way. Or devotion to God, faith in God, that's also another way. And both will work. Um, one more verse and then we'll stop. Avidyayam bahuda vartamana Vayam kritartha itya bhimanyanti bala Yat karmino na pravedayanti ragat Tena tu rakshina lokas chavante Translation. Basically the same thing. Little variation. Continuing diversely in the midst of ignorance, the unenlightened take airs by thinking, we have attained the goal. Since the men engaged in karma do not understand the truth, under the influence of attachment. Thereby they become afflicted with sorrow and are deprived of heaven on the exhaustion of the results of karma. Avidyayam bahuda vartamana In the midst of ignorance and its multiple products. As I said, it's not just some kind of philosophical, oh, I don't know I am Brahman. That doesn't seem to be such a serious problem. But no, the consequences are very serious. When I think, inevitably I'll think, I am this body. Okay? Then what? But if I think I am this body, every problem of this body is my problem then. And then everything related to this body becomes related to me. These are my parents and um, my relatives and children and grandchildren. This is my house and this is my car and this is my dog and my money. Those are others. They are separate from me. All of it comes from body identification. And then what I want in life a um, lot of money and good food and pleasure and entertainment and power and, and endless desires. Again, identification because of identification with this little personality. And that is inevitable. You can't get out of it. This is called Bahuda in various ways. It's not simply, I don't know that I am Brahman. The results of that are various. And the road to freedom he is always open. We block it ourselves. Vayam kritartha iti abhimanyanti bala. We think we are fulfilled. And we say, no, it's not really true that all is suffering. I'm doing pretty well. Things are going well for me. Um, I'm educated. I live in a first world country and uh, I have money and I am uh, young and um, I have many friends. I know I don't have it all. But I'm a kind of, I don't demand much. I'm a quite reasonable guy. I'm, I'm quite well satisfied. You're asking for serious trouble. And very soon, Abhimanyanti, <laughs> uh, think that we are fulfilled. Things are going well. Or, of course, here is referring to the performer of Vedic rituals. I have performed all these great rituals. Things are going well in this life. And after death, I shall go to heaven. I'm set. What the Americans say, I'm set. <laughs> it's all set for me. For a great life and a great post life, post mortem existence, everything is great. No. Balaha, Shankaracharya says, it's called children. What do we mean by children? Shankaracharya says, Agyaninaha, the ignorant, those who do not know the truth. Um, they do not know the truth. Why not? Shankaracharya comments here, Pravedayanti Tattvam, na Pravedayanti Tattvam, na Jananti. They do not know the truth. Truth about, of course, about Brahman, but also about the nature of this world. 
they turn their eyes away from the nature of this world. It is all impermanent, all going to come crashing down very soon. Why not? Why do why do they avert their eyes from this truth? Ragad, because of attachment, desire, death. It's there. And it's our serious problem. You'll see 99% of people, they will say, we don't really, it's not a problem. We don't think about it. We don't think about it. But why not? If there was a serious problem in our lives, we immediately start thinking about it. It's the slightest problem. A little pain in the body, um, little downturn in the Wall Street, uh, you know, financial problem, medical problem, uh, relationship problem. Immediately, we constantly start worrying about it. How come we are not worried about death? The biggest, biggest problem for all, we are. We just avoid it. And the reason we avoid it is raga, because of desire. Desire for what? Karma phala raga, uh, 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 raga abhibhavan, abhibhavan ivittam. Because of being overcome by the desire for the results of karma. Remember, the context is those who perform Vedic rituals wanting certain things in life. So because we are waiting, you know, it's, it's like how eagerly you order uh, things on uh, Amazon Prime. And you eagerly wait. When is it coming? Uh -huh. One day delivery. Come on, one day delivery. We eagerly wait for like kids for their presents. Similarly, our attention is focused on all the goodies which are going to come in life. And therefore, we, we avoid, avert our vision from the terrible truth. Then what happens? Atura, Dukkhata, troubled, sorely troubled by sorrow. Even the heaven which they win, the greatest of prizes. So most modern people don't believe in it, so they, they, they're not bothered by it. But imagine those ancient people truly believed the best life, we are having a great life here, the best life is still waiting for us. After, we, after death, we'll go to these wonderful worlds. And they will go to these wonderful worlds. But Kshina Lokaha, these worlds will also decay. Trina karma falaha, as your karma credit runs out, as the good karma is spent. Swargaloka javante, they fall from their heavenly abodes, back into this life again. And when, when it's gone, it's all gone. Just like in this life. Um, somebody told me, that it was an elderly lady, she said, Swami, it was just the other day that I came to Vedanta as this young girl. <laughs> so we, where did 30, 40, 50 years go? We can just think about it right now. We can imagine, we can remember, uh, um, you know, important moments in our childhood, in our teenage. We can clearly remember. And that's 40, 50, 60 years have gone. And it looks like, it seems like a flash. And the remaining time, suppose you live for 80, 90, 100 years, um, a psychologist said that um, time doesn't flow, psychological time doesn't flow in the same way. So a um, person who's going to live for say, 80 years or 90 years, by the time you're 50 or 60, it's not that you know, like half of your life is gone and half is remaining. Technically, that's true. But psychologically, three-fourths of the life is gone or four-fifths of the life is gone. Um, in the next 30, 40 years will pass just like that because as you become more mature, you don't register the flow of time in the same way. And all the important, interesting things have already happened in the past and it's gone and done with. And the rest of it is the same, technically the same amount of time, but it won't feel like that. It will feel it's as if each year is just like the last year and it's moving very fast. So this is the problem with, um, with the ritualistic religion. Why is he talking at all about this? Because this relates to the question which was asked, what is that by knowing which everything can be known? And the teacher says, you are asking the ultimate question. What is the ultimate reality of the universe? Who you, who am I? You are asking that question. Everything else, including the best things, science, religion, art, are still not enough. Houston Smith, when he's talking about the different religions of the world in his book, Religions of the, uh, the World's Religions, he talks about the four goals in Hinduism. You know, pleasure and the wealth and uh, dharma, morality and religion and moksha, liberation. He says, after we have experienced all the best things in this life, he gives the example of um, Beethoven. 
you hear Beethoven and then a little small voice says, is this all? This is the highest thing, most highest aesthetic enjoyment that life can give. And you still ask, is this all? This is a magnificent, but still, is this all? There's nothing more in life. So none of this can fulfill the human heart because we are actually infinite. Only the infinite can fulfill us. So what? Uh, what's next then? It's not a council of despair. It's not a council of pessimism. Uh, next, he says, you have to go with this question. Now he has cleared the deck. The question which you came with originally, what is that by knowing which everything can be known? This is the real question. And so go ready as a spiritual seeker in search of enlightenment. This is real. Brahman is real. God realization, self-knowledge is real. And that's the real purpose of life. You're actually blessed that you have come to this position. And he has just you know, pushed back every other goal to the background. Because none of them will be uh, fulfilling. None of them will take you beyond suffering. Only this will take you beyond suffering. So what will happen in the next few classes is the student will now go to the teacher, the, ask the question, and the teaching will start. How do you realize this? The teaching about Brahman will start. Good. Let's take a look at the comments and questions. Sri Ram is saying if the puja worship is directed exclusively for getting Ishwadarshan Mukti, do they get transformed into laudable spiritual method and what role does it play in us? Good. I forgot to answer this because I should have raised this point myself. Remember, it is not a criticism of religion, though it looks like a severe criticism of conventional religion, of pujas and rituals. No. What uh, technically what has been done is a criticism of sakama karma, karma done with worldly desires, rituals done with worldly desires. Those are being criticized. And again, they are being not being criticized because you know they're not saying that it is superstitious, it will not work, those are just blind faith, it, it, these are uh, not real. No, they are very much real. The Vedic religion recognizes that um, the rituals that we do, they will give you results. But even when they give you results, it's not ultimately fulfilling. However, then if you are seeking God realization for us, for the rest of us, uh, do those rituals have no meaning? Pujas and everything? No. Remember, the pujas and rituals which are done uh, for the sake of God realization they must be done. They are included. They are not included in this criticism. They form a part, part of our spiritual sadhana for God realization. So they will become karma yoga. Not this karma, which is ritualistic karma, sakama karma, meant for getting things in this world and the next world. So there's a, the same karma, same pujas can now be done. You can worship God, not for not asking for anything in this world, asking for purity of mind, asking for devotion, asking for knowledge. That's good. That's fully supported in Vedanta. So, criticism of rituals because they do not lead to the highest. If those rituals are done for worldly purposes, and they are mostly done, but the same rituals can be done as Karma Yoga, and then it is fully accepted in Vedanta. Sangeeta is asking, to what do you attribute some people's most dynamic and spiritual productive part of the life to have begun as later age? Srila Prabhupada's case. Yes, age, um, you never know. In general, you see uh, uh, mostly elderly people in uh, religious gatherings, especially spiritual organizations. Uh, and I've seen monks always complaining, even in India, that only old people come to the ashram in fact, in many times when swamis would come to give talks in the ashram next to which I grew up, I used to be the only kid around. And everybody else, were, they were all elderly people, mostly grandparents or some uncles and aunties. That's natural, actually. Um, it takes a little while for the nature of the world to sink in. And then that maturity comes in when people start seeking. It depends on our um, spiritual development. Um, so the point is, whenever we get that impulse, that's great. That's great. And when you follow it up energetically, it doesn't take much time. So even if we get that spiritual impulse in advanced stage, it doesn't matter. You start right then, it can be done. Anu is saying, 
rather than try to repress desire, should we just see the limitations over and over again? Even as we fulfill a few of them in this way, we will eventually outgrow them. True. Mm -hmm. If you strenuously try to repress desires, then it just adds energy to them. So the householder life, for example, fulfill the desires within the limits of dharma and reflect on that. And so as long as we are in this world, you're going to eat, you're going to meet people, you're going to you know, um, go for a vacation. That's fine. There's nothing wrong in that. It's over time we come to see this is not the point of it and not make a big fuss about trying to fulfill you know, desires one after another. As as I quoted Christopher Isherwood saying that, uh, it, it's silly to say that and uh, to condemn worldly desires. Don't pretend that you don't enjoy them. But the insanity lies in thinking that they will fulfill us. Rekhaji says, rituals done for the love of God. Absolutely. Rituals done for the love of God are very much part of Vedanta. They are not part of Karmakanda. Patrick says, is contemplating our psychological state of ignorance for inspiring more sadhana or does it have another function? No, it points out um, uh, the source of our trouble and encourages us to inquire and to start on the, on the spiritual path. Gaurav says, problem with rituals is results as finite, where Advaita leads to results as in transcend time and space. Correct. Uh, if you want things from the rituals, they will give you limited things because the rituals themselves are limited. Advaita gives the unlimited Brahman, which is your real nature. Um, is Asha or Nirasha the Mula Vyadhi to be dealt with in sadhana? Expectation of worldly results, is it the root problem? Um, yes. See, expectation of worldly results, as long as you expect them to fulfill you totally, then it's a problem. If you know that yeah, I'm hungry, food is going to um, remove my hunger. But if, if like it's as the old saying goes, you should um, eat to live rather than live to eat. And that's a good way of putting it. M most people, the problem is we are living to eat, not literally eating. We are basically eating the world, <laughs> consuming the world. And we are living for that. And that is not fulfilling. That's the point. Then what do we do? What do what should we consume then? Consume God. <laughs> so turn this desire to a God word in devotion, in knowledge, in meditation, in service. Then it will be fulfilling. It will be fulfilling not only at the end. Moment to moment it will be fulfilling. Interestingly enough, some of the holiest in, uh, places of origin... Advaita teachings are deeply following rituals and pujas on a daily basis. Yes, but remember, those are rituals and pujas for um, spirituality, for realization, or for the welfare of uh, the community, not for the purpose of getting, uh, you know, personal, worldly, or other worldly goals. Somebody's laptop is about to die and takes leave. So this is the very nature of, even the laptop is, is part of this <laughs> transient world. Don't worry, charge it, it will be born again. It will, <laughs> the laptop will come alive again, just like us. Parul says, with the festive season upon us, there's a rising trend of some home pujas, they're distinctly social occasion. Is it okay not to attend upon an invitation? Once in a while, as long as your time uh, and energy is spent in spiritual practice, meditation, devotion, Vedantic study, um, I know most of the pujas tend to have an overtly social dimension. So you may attend some and uh, give others a miss. All right. Uh, Anuradhadi. Okay. It's on the Shankaracharya's Bhashyam. The last word I cannot... Uh... Uh, what is the word? How do you break it? It's, uh, swarga Loka... Chaya... What uh, does Chavante means do... to, to slip and fall. To slip Say and that fall. Again? Chavante. Swarga Lokat Chavante. Swarga Lokat. From the heavenly world to descend or to, uh, to fall from or to lose that state. Krishna says to um, Arjuna that Shine Punye Matya Lokam Vishanti. As the, the heaven heaven dwellers, 
as their good karma runs out, as their punya karma, the merit runs out, they he uses exactly the same uh, verb. Okay. Chavanti. Uh, they slip and fall. The heaven dwellers slip and fall back into our mortal world. Even those, uh, the heavenly worlds are also mortal, but they are much more long-lived than us. Compared to us, they might as well be mortal. But then they fall back to this worldly state. Um, and he will say that um, in the next mantra, not only this world, they may fall back into uh, the animal worlds also. So such a great fall might be there. So imagine, having at a human birth, performing Vedic rituals, going to heaven, and then tumbling back into and being born as an animal. So it really didn't help at all. Maybe. I mean, not always. Good. Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupa Namastu